So what about the case of abusive parents? What, what does Islam say about that? Islam, that's a very good question. I think I, I uh, highlighted it uh, slightly, but I didn't elaborate. Even if one's parents are abusive, you, they still have a certain right upon you, and you still have to treat them with kindness and justice, because your ultimate relationship is with God. As in, you are pleasing the Creator by fulfilling their rights, even though from a technical point of view, they have fortified their right of kind treatment, but because you're not dealing with them, you're dealing with the Creator, you maintain kindness even if you are receiving oppression on the other end. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. My next question. Um, you talked about how in an ideal Islamic society there would be no oppression, including you being against the oppression of women. Yet, in your entire speech, you kept using masculine pronouns, mankind, him, his, and in an ideal Islamic society, you're not representing half of your society, and in this case, half of this room. So don't you think you're contributing to this oppression? Just asking. That's a good question too. That's called the loaded question, with a pop at the end. Uh, I, I see how you can see it this way. I understand if you're looking at it from that perspective, how it may appear like this, but once again, Islam has what we call equity and not equality per se between males and females. As in, there are certain rights and obligations and favors that the females have that the males don't have and vice versa. And so in this context, when it comes to revelation, when it comes to prophethood, when it comes to that leadership position, in the society, meaning the ultimate leader position, that has been designated to the males in Islam. So not that the women... You say Islam doesn't treat genders equally. Oh, absolutely not. You said Islam doesn't have equality, you have equity, and you proceeded to explain this equity, so therefore, it's not equality. No, it's not equality. I told you it's not equality. Okay. You it, said it was equality. No, I didn't. I said, look, what I'm saying is, how do I explain this to you? Okay, you have two children, a boy and a girl. So if you put makeup for the girl, do you have to put makeup for the boy? If he wants to, why not? <laughs> if he wants to wear a bra, you also let him wear a bra? If he has moves, why not? Here we go again. So now we go back to the early discussion, which is where do you draw the line? Because you could say if he wants to, why not? And he says, Mommy. I like that pedophile neighbor of ours. Can I go see? No, 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 I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. Because you're telling me right now, the child, excuse me, it's only fair that I speak. You're saying, I'm following your, your line of thinking. You're saying, if the child wants, why not? The child wants something right now that is, he wants to kill the neighbor. When do you say to him, no, at which point, and who decides the yes and the no? Don't to and because are these not real real issues? They're not epidemics in the world today. You just answer my question. Who decides what is right and what is wrong? Certainly not you, but yeah. Of course not me. I, oh, by all means, not me. That's why I said in the beginning, God. So uh, according to your logic, if the kid wants to wear a bra and a makeup, he could. Also, if he wants to kill the cat down the street and go out and do something crazy, you also don't have the right to tell him no. Because he wants it, and he's entitled to it. No, you find parents who have no belief in religion will say, you're a boy, you play with cars, you're a girl, you play with Barbie. It's just, these are human innate things. Now, today people are changing that, but the changes are bringing about negative results. So, I stick to my guidelines. Islam does not look at men and women are equal, it looks at them as each responsible in their own way with different roles to play in the society. And they complete one another. Without the women, men will not be able to do anything. Without the men, women will not be able to do anything. They complement one another. Together, they make a successful society, not individually. It does not mean that their rights are equal.
it does not mean that their rights are 100% equal. That's why the Prophet himself said that the mother has three times the right of the father. Why didn't you look at that as favoritism for females over males? The Prophet clearly favored... Thank you. We didn't see any father say, hey, 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 that's not fair. Why the mother three times and I come at the end? Because in this area, the Prophet gave women a right that men don't have. Because God, we believe, of course, legislated this, we submit, we understand that our wisdom and our intellect, no matter how advanced it gets, it remains inferior to God's. You cannot be wiser than the Creator. And if He legislated this, it's for a good reason. It's been tested, proven to be successful. Okay. Dogs, what do you have to say about that? What about dogs? The Miss University case in point, a lot of people, and I'm, I'm sad to say this, Muslims, a majority of those people tend to mistreat the dogs around campus, chasing them, harassing them, sometimes even killing them, so... Not allowed. Not allowed? Islam does not, Islam has an issue with the dog's saliva. Because we consider the dog's saliva to be impure. So yes, a Muslim has the right to avoid a dog that may try to lick him. And if a dog were to lick a Muslim, he is obliged to wash that part seven times. That does not allow him to hurt the dog. So it's one thing that you have a ruling about the saliva and the impurity of the saliva of the dog. And it's a whole other thing that we chase a dog and we mistreat them and we oppress them. Because we're back to square one, which is you're afflicting harm upon another creation and Islam does not legislate that. So the actions of Muslims in this context, unfortunately, is sad, but it does not, is not supported by the Islamic teachings. Thank you, and one last question. Wow. We've discussed this in one of the lectures here. Um, you can go to YouTube and type misconceptions about Islam uh, and put my name and there's a lecture which was delivered here maybe four years ago that went through all of these different specifics. So for the time reasons and to address other questions, you can watch the lecture and get the full answer inshallah. You're welcome, thank you for the questions. But he's not on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, never mind. It's one of my lame jokes. You'll get used to it with time, inshallah. Um, I have, is it possible to go with three questions? Yes, yeah. Sure. Right, right, right. All right, great. So, uh, my first question would be that um, during the lecture, you mentioned that hypothetically, if there was an Islamic state, there would be several rulings, such as what you mentioned. But uh, nowadays, in such a um, in such an individualistic society or an individualistic thinking society, how could these rules or teachings could be applied, although there is somewhat not of an Islamic state existing? So how could this be somewhat relevant in our time? It might not be that relevant today. Uh, we are we're living at the time which the Prophet described, peace be upon him, that the time of of where you become strange. You know, if you adhere to the religion, it's like you're holding on to a burning coal and Islam will become strange among its own people. And we are living this time. So we have to start from the foundations that the Prophet started with. And the Prophet started with knowledge. He started with uh, monotheism. He started with the establishment of the belief in God and, and, and the ad, you know, admiring the rules and sticking to them and adhering to them and promoting that among the people before you go on to the other areas. Today, Muslims want to bypass all of the foundational steps and they want to jump to the last thing. And it's not working. And so it becomes incumbent on us to start where the Prophet started. And that means that some of these could be sidelined or we have to wait until they, you know, they see the light. Until then, forcing an uh, forcing them upon the people will bring no benefit. And so the time dictates 
that even though I'm speaking in an idealistic scenario, it could not be implemented 100% today. That should not prevent us, however, from making that effort of promoting them and teaching them and establishing them. If we can't see them, then our generations could. Um, my second would be that you mentioned uh, during the session that there were people that would go into churches and bomb them and so on and so forth. So you said us Muslims are completely innocent from them. It's not our fault. So what, bring, what brings to my mind is that then whose fault is it? The individual who's taking part of this. But what would go back? So, but okay, the individual. But if you look at the individual and trace, what could be the, the issue of them having such misconceptions? I mentioned earlier, there are texts. There are texts within the religion that are open to multiple interpretations. And so, like any other, like any other field, whether it is other religions or medicine or what have you, the way you look at a certain text, the way you interpret it in your own way, subjectively, actually determines what actions you will take in regards to this thing. And so this, this issue is difficult to, to manage because it has to do with people's interpretation of texts who often the Prophet described, like the Khawarij, they are known for not looking at the overall picture, but they look at certain texts and they basically take them out of context and they exaggerate their implementation of those certain texts, overlooking the overall, you know, concept or the baqsad of the sharia, the objective of the Islamic legislation. The irony in this is that the Prophet already told us that those people exist, and he described them to us, and he told us their tendencies and their behavior, and the ones I explained earlier, those who go out and commit acts of violence that harm others, they fit exactly into the description of the Prophet, whom he called to be the dogs of the fire, the worst of people, are those type of people. So it's not a surprise to us, nor is it rocket science, because any Muslim who knows the texts will be able to apply those descriptions to those types of individuals that misrepresent Islam, even if they're using an Islamic evidence. Similarly within Christianity, if you want to look at the Crusaders, then you could say the Crusaders were basing their actions on texts from the Bible. And you will find opposing Christians that will say, no, you're taking these texts out of context and this doesn't apply. It's the same kind of debate within the followers of the same religion. Okay. Uh, on to my third question would be that um, at, nowadays in these times, the Quran has, has, has been somewhat... Uh, taken as a regard of a book of literature than as a book of action. So you have people that would come out and, um, and emphasize on the linguistic uh, amazingness, if that is a word, of, of the Quran, and how it's a scientific, uh, how many scientific uh, relations it has and whatnot. But then when it, but it is fairly, um, in this time, taken as, as, as the Sahaba would, um, they take it word by word and they actually work on it and put it into practical use. Yes. So why why is it why has it turned into a, a literature then, rather than a book of commandment? Uh, what is the ayah in Surah Al Furqan? وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Allah says in the Quran that the Prophet will say, Oh my Lord, verily my people have taken this Quran as something that they've abandoned. So it is already revealed that the Muslims will have the tendency to turn away from the revelation in the full sense and restrict it to certain areas of their interest. Something that is in, uh, convenient, I would say, for them. And that doesn't make it right. And actually the reason why Muslims, even though we promote and we discuss the idealism of Islam and how perfect it is, but when you look at the Muslim themselves, the Muslims themselves, you don't see the implementation is for the very reason that we also amongst ourselves have turned away from the revelation. That's why every lecture and every talk aims at bringing awareness to the non-Muslims about what Islam is and reminding the Muslims about our shortcomings. And if we both did our jobs, then it would become clearer for the one who's looking from the outside into the you know, inside. They will understand how it works. So it's an obligation on us 
not to restrict the Quran as a book of literature or the scientific miracles of the Quran, even though those are elements of interest for certain people. At the end of the day, the Quran is a miracle in the sense that it combines everything you need. It's tailored for you to address different crowds with different backgrounds. And you have to customize your usage of the miracle, miraculous nature of the Quran to attract people according to their interest. Because if someone is not into literature and you discuss with them the, the, you know, the, the aspect of literature in Islam or in the Quran, that's not a cool topic for them. They're into scientific things. So you bring the scientific evidences if, you know, if they're relevant. So it's about you being aware of the book and its strength and then you know, using that in, in a sense to bring awareness to the people about why this book is the only scripture that has been preserved and maintained for all these years and why it is the ultimate guide for mankind from their misery. You're welcome, sir. Barakallah feek. Alright, so since we have a lot of questions from the floor, I have to give clarity to do it right. When a question is being asked to be said from the floor, you have to ask your question, and then you're allowed one full one. If you still are interested to speak to the speaker, you may wait for the rest of the audience to ask their question. So the question says, why can't we just respect each other's beliefs about religion? rather than accepting what Islam says. Very nice. That would be very lovely um, if it didn't come with a loophole. Meaning, we go back to the discussion with the young lady. Respect other people's beliefs, right? So my belief is to bring a cat and hang it from this projector and burn it. That's my, that's my religion, man. Fire worshippers will offer as a sacrifice a human being, another animal, something of the sort. And they say, maybe your brother is the most, you know, preferred, uh, you know, victim. Go ahead, man. Sorry, with old, yeah, I respect you. Go ahead, man. Knock yourself out, you know. <laughs> Record it on YouTube video so we can upload on YouTube, make some money out of the whole thing because that's going to get a lot of hits. Where do you draw the line? Of course, you know, we respect. You have to respect people's ideas and their individuality and what have you but only when their belief does not transgress onto you islam does not impose on non-muslims the rules that we adhere to meaning islam recognizes that someone living assuming in an islamic state they want to continue to worship jesus go ahead islam will never force someone to come and become Muslim in spite of themselves. It gives you the choice, it gives you the invitation, but it recognizes your choices. At the time of the Prophet, many people didn't accept Islam. And it was something that was just dealt with, it's, it's the way it is. So we don't have an issue with respecting other people's beliefs, we're not trying to impose, but as long as your beliefs don't affect other human beings, otherwise it's all good. Yes, Islam recognizes Islam and there are other religions and what have you. And all we do is dialogue. What we don't do, if you consider me speaking against your belief to be lack of respect, then that's where we have an issue. I will not do anything physically, but to reach a point where I may not voice my opinion while you may voice yours, then that becomes a suppression of freedom of speech that you yourself are promoting. You're verbally telling us that you don't believe in God. I'm verbally telling you I believe in God. And you can verbally convince me that there's no God and I can verbally convince you that there is a God. And that's a right that we both have. At the end of the day, it's not like I have a sword behind my back. So what is the bottom line? You don't believe there's a God? Okay, <laughs> chop off his head. End of discussion. If, have you seen a Muslim do this? No, we part. You don't believe in God? All right, man, see you tomorrow. Khalas, what can we do? We, we, leave, we respect that. Respecting it as in, it's your right. It doesn't mean that I'm going to cheer you for it and encourage you and say, all right, that's good for you, man. Because I care for you as a human being. I believe in the hereafter. I want, I want goodness for you now and later. So out of my care for fellow humans, because I believe there is a day of judgment, and because we are the followers of the prophets, we, we wear the same hat of conveying the message of God to mankind. If they accept it, congratulations. If they don't, it's too bad. From your lecture, I know Islam is a beautiful religion. Thank you. How does someone enter this religion? 
And I have one question. I have a good life. Why do I need God in my life? Hmm. Uh, this is the same person? Yeah. <laughs> How does that mean? <laughs> no way, man. It's like someone, you know, they're promoting being vegetarian and says, so where's the steak? Weren't you telling us we should eat vegetables all the time, man? Um, all right, well, I mean, how do you enter Islam? From the, through the door. And, uh, you know, the door of Islam is a declaration of faith. You bear witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except God, Allah. That's his name in Arabic. And that you bear witness that Muhammad is his uh, messenger. And you follow the rules of Islam to the best of your ability. You will never be perfect. We are never perfect. We will have shortcomings and sins. But you, you know, you go by the articles of faith, you become a believer. But you say you have a good life, so why do you need to have God in your life? That's very interesting because you only have a good life because of God. How else do you have a good life? Is it because of your own making? Really? How many people follow the very steps of success? Two people, both are intelligent, both start a business. One will become a millionaire within two years and the other one is bankrupt. True or false? True. True. Why? It's because this matter is beyond you. So if you say you have a good life, I will say to you, the reason you have a good life is because of God. How about being grateful? How about being grateful to God? By knowing Him and worshipping Him and, and loving Him. And there's no harm or shame in saying that. Yes, worship God. We humans love to worship. It's built in. The, the, you know, glorifying something else, looking up to something else. And when it's not God, it's going to be some other human being who, who has flaws like you. People look up to certain actors or certain singers and certain celebrities, and then they find out that these people are as corrupt as someone can be. And that's the reality. Because there's that vacuum, there's that need to look up to someone. And if you don't have a prophet to look up to as a human example, then you're going to look up to someone else who will disappoint you at some point in time. Better, that, better than that from a human example point of view, if someone deserves your love and gratefulness and appreciation, it's the one who is managing this universe. Around the clock, taking care of you from the time you were born, since you were in your mother's womb, when you had no control over anything, you could have been cut off supply in your mother's womb, and no doctor can save you. Who allowed you to grow and then get, you know, be born and then your parents to care enough for you to look after you? Maybe imagine if the parents, as soon as you got sick for the first time, they said, forget this ch child, man, I don't have time for this. And they let you die. How many times did you get sick? How many times did someone take care of you, whether your parents or someone else? Someone continued to take care of you until you're 20, 25, 30 years old. Who's doing this except God? Then you, you don't need him in your life? You could. And the, the, the amazing thing is that God gave people that very right. You don't have to. Show no appreciation. Show no thankfulness. And He will continue to give you. No problem. God told us in the Quran. He will continue to give you as much as you want. Except that when you die and you're resurrected for the day of judgment, just don't ask for anything. Don't, don't expect anything. Because you, you got what you wanted in this world. You got everything you wanted and more. Now you haven't earned anything in the life to come. You have no real estate, no property, nothing. And that's, that's just what it is. People have that choice, but it's a terrible choice. Well, if that's the case, then I would like to open the floor back from the sister's side first. Please, just over there. I wanted to ask, like, in your talk, that most of the points you mentioned are basically the base for most of the religions or the ethical or moral code, what would make Islam special to emphasize on these points? Very good question. What makes Islam special is that I gave you, as they say, titles or bullet points. But if I were to elaborate on each in great detail, all of you will fall asleep first. Uh, then you would understand the, the magnitude of what I'm saying. Meaning other, I, I agree with you, for the most part, most divine religions or even religions of other human creation, to some degree, they agree to the same kind of framework and foundation, but they lack detail. Only Islam gives you specific details. For example, in Islam, if a person were to pass away, 
the law of inheritance is so specific as to who gets what, depending on how many family members. It's, it's, it's very complex and advanced. Other religions may have general guidelines, but they don't have these specifications. And the, the same applies to everything. The relationship between male and female. You know, other religions may give you some highlights of how it's supposed to be. But in terms of implementation, it's pretty much up to you. Or pretty much up to the church, for example. Or up to the denomination. Or up to the culture. Or up to the society. But Islam, you know, gives you specific details to the nitty gritty about how everything should be done. Leaving no room for doubt. Only if you turn away from those guidelines, you will find yourself somewhere else astray. If you adhere to the guidelines, you're pretty much guaranteed protection. So Islam, it, it, it agrees with other religions in the sense, but it gives you specifications and details and a very detailed law that enables you to implement them, not theoretically, physically, in real life. And other religions... I don't believe they have the same to offer, with all due respect. Any follow up questions, sir? Then, yeah. further side, a question yeah. from the board. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just have to stick to the rules and regulations. We need the brothers to have a question. But I'll hold on to Yeah, keep the mic. Keep the mic. Yeah, please keep the mic. Questions? Don't make it look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Sister, please. <laughs> Hello? Okay. So in reference to what you were saying earlier, actually before the previous question, you're saying that you have a good life because God takes care of you, right? But yeah. my question is like, what about those people that have terrible lives? Those refugees, those that are kidnapped for sex trafficking and all those things. That's not a good life. Agreed. And this is why, see, it's, I'm so happy you asked this question because that is actually a topic in and of itself, which we've discussed and I have a lecture on this uh, on YouTube. Uh, it was titled Answering Bart Ehrman, Why We Suffer. Right? There was, I don't know if you guys know who Bart Ehrman is or was. But he was, a, he was a Christian theologian who basically studied the Bible to the extent that he disbelieved in the Bible. And he chose agnosticism. Even though he's still a professor who teaches the Bible. And he had, and the reason why he left Christianity is he couldn't, he couldn't add up how can there be a loving, merciful God and yet have suffering in this world, right? Sounds like a very powerful argument. And so a whole lecture was prepared and uh, a addressing this topic and answering it in great detail from an Islamic perspective with textual evidence as to how do we bring a relation or how do we, you know, uh, harmonize the concept of people suffering in Africa, for example, somewhere in Africa, a child right now could be dying from starvation and we're chilling over here having a good time. And then there's a God who's managing the whole universe. How, does, how do you reconcile between these two? It's very simple. Because as I said in the beginning, when we look at Islam, we look at... Now how do I explain this? Okay, this is, this is the one's life. The, the existence of the soul. Actually, it goes beyond the stable. It's eternal, right? It's beyond the stable. And this is the worldly life. This is the worldly life. Where you could have a blast. You could be Bill Gates. You could be, uh, you know, Michael Jackson. Too late. Um, <laughs> you could be, I don't know who, 50 cents. He went broke. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> he knew it from the beginning. He said, man, let me see. $10? Nah. They told him $10. I said, nah, 50 cents. Yeah, 50 cents it is, Habibi. Anyways, uh, so from the beginning, this is the whole worldly life. You may struggle over here. You have no control over what happens over here. In fact, in Islam, you could be leading a blast life, like the coolest life ever. And then for eternity, you have nada, nothing. Or... You could be a refugee, running, a, running around from one country to another. No one wants to accept you. No one wants to endorse you. No one wants to support you. And you could die with someone bombing you. And your life is terrible in our, in our eyes, in our evaluation. But with God, 
This person has suffered so much in this worldly life, they deserve no suffering in the life to come. While you look at them saying poor things, we are actually the poor things. You are the one who's still chilling. And you have all these blessings which you may not even be showing any gratitude for. And they are the ones that you're pitying. Oh, they had it bad. But they're already enjoying the bliss of God in the life to come. So as long as you understand the Islamic perspective, and this is all over the religion, from the beginning of the Quran until the end of the Quran, this is the main message of the religion of Islam. That, إِنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ Allah says in the Quran, this worldly life is nothing but game and entertainment. And then the life to come is the real deal. The life hereafter is the real deal. So sure, someone can struggle now, but they will be having the best life in the life to come. What matters is that what is within your control, you take care of. Meaning because of that, it doesn't mean that you let refugees continue to suffer and say, Yalla, let it be worse. At least they're going to go to paradise. No, you still have an obligation as a human being to help and support. But don't look at them as someone who is underprivileged in both lives. You can make that assessment for this worldly life, but with their creator, they have a whole nother discussion. And that is from the might of God and the power of God. That he gave us no control over what happens when someone dies. Once someone passes away, you can talk to them, you can communicate with them, you can change anything, it's done, you have no control, you lost that connection with that soul. That soul has gone back to its Lord. And its Lord is merciful. Its Lord, as I mentioned earlier, does not oppress anyone. He will never oppress anyone. He takes everything into account and everyone will be dealt with justly. We trust God. We trust that when someone goes away, he will be in good hands. The question says, a typical misconception of Islam is that it is oppressive, especially to women. Mm. You mentioned anything that starts with ISM is a disease. What about feminism? It's a disease. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Standing up for each other, standing up, standing up for each other should not be looked down. In addition, personally believe that women should lead not just men. Islam protects women to the extent that women have no right to have a say. What do you think of feminism and strong women leading? You must be unaware of history. Before Islam, before Islam, women really had no say. Women couldn't inherit. Women could Okay, tell me another religion. Fine. You know that in Islam, a woman is not allowed to change her last name to that of her husband's because she has her own individuality which Islam will never compromise. How many other cultures, when a woman you know, marries another man, she carries his last name, even if they divorce or he dies, she now has changed her, her relevance to her own family tree because of marriage. Where do you think this came from? Islam prohibits that. That has existed before Islam and it exists until now. So before Islam, women couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, vote. Women couldn't do this. Women couldn't do that. Women used to be buried alive. At the time of the Prophet and the Arab, uh, Arabian Peninsula, when a, a person would have a daughter, they would bury her alive because they thought that women were shameful. And Allah revealed verses in the Quran. When the, when the girl that was buried alive will be asked, for which crime was she killed? Meaning this is a reprimand from God for mankind who have done this. So Islam actually gave women rights that they never enjoyed before. That said, you have to know again where to draw the line. If you want the woman to become like the man, then you're asking for the impossible. Do you not see that God made us physically different? Because we are psychologically different? Because we are mentally different? It's the most logical thing in the world. Malish, I don't want to be explicit or graphic. Male, female. Dude. Put it together. It's, it's what it is. 
and they're not the same. They're not the same physically. Why do you want them to be the same in terms of their role in this world? It, it, it will not be successful. You could, you could, and people try. A husband is washing the dishes, and a woman is out, you know, building uh, construction. You can do that. Sure, you can do that. It's up to you. We're not saying that the woman's role is to be in the kitchen. We're not limiting that. However, the role of the mother in the house in terms of catering for the children is something the man can never do. And I'm telling you, I'm a father. I don't have the patience to deal with my children for more than six minutes. <laughs> and I love them. After six minutes, like, listen, man. <laughs> Ask your mother. Can I eat the pancake with a banana? I want to put the amma. Hell, amma, ya amma. Ya amma, eat the whole fridge, ya chef. Can I? Do I don't have. The mother sits there and breaks it down. Let me show you how to make a pancake. Yeah, chef. I'm gonna go show my son how to make a pancake. I don't need. I barely know how to eat a pancake. If it's healthy. So the, we just, it's, I, I, I identify, I respect my wife for things that she does that I will never be able to do. I, I don't even want to do. Because I'm incapable. And trust me, I'm speaking for 90% of men. I know you will find exceptions to the rule, but I told you in the beginning, we don't care about exceptions. Because exceptions cannot highlight everybody else. And the wife doesn't want to do the job of a male either. Because it takes away from her feminine nature so it's just logic it's a very logical thing we respect the individuality of the roles i don't want the male to be a female and i don't want the female to be a male otherwise things will get mixed up and exactly what we see today children are confused because they don't know who's running the show sometimes and so don't don't confuse the fact that we differentiate between the roles as that being a reason for women to become negligible or unimportant or inferior. They can never be inferior. There, there isn't a prophet except that he was born from a mother, including the miraculous birth of Jesus. There was no father involved, but there was a mother. There has to be a mother. And no one can replace a mother. No one can replace a sister. No one can replace a wife. No one can replace a daughter. No one can replace an aunt. They're not, the uncle is not like the aunt. You don't have the same kind of conversations with them. You don't have the same discussions with them. It's about identifying the difference between them and giving each their due right. Those rights vary, but each are relevant to their nature. And it's the perfect creation of God. I insist, it is the perfect creation of God. Another question from the floor says, why a nation such as Sweden, Germany, Germany, without religion is better than a nation such as the ones in the Middle East, Islamic countries? More corruption happened in the Islamic country, more oppression happened in the Islamic country. Has religion failed to instill fear in the people of religion? Are you saying this because Germany beat Brazil 7-1? I don't know what's the basis that Germany is considered to be more successful than um, other countries. I think that is a subjective a view of things because our, our outlook on success is not necessarily by just looking at statistics. While I agree with you that certain Western countries that adhere to what is ironic, Islamic rules that they don't call Islamic, which Muslims themselves abandon, because of that abandonment of the Muslims of their own rules and the implementation of those rules in other countries, they have become superior. Sure, no one can deny that. I'm the first one to admit. You will find that in certain countries, if you were to look at the core of the reason why they are successful, you will find that somewhere in the background, it is in reference, it's based on some Islamic teaching. It doesn't have to be that they looked through Islam and they got it. No, no, no. They probably were clueless about Islam. They did it for material reasons. But you will find the relation between that and the Islamic teaching somewhere. That same teaching, Muslims and Muslim countries abandon and therefore we seem to be inferior. No doubt. That becomes an issue of human implementation, not divine revelation. 
It's an issue of human implementation and not divine revelation. The revelation is clear. The implementation is our mistake. Our mistake. For example, in Muslim countries, predominantly speaking, it is extremely normal for you to roll down the window and flick a cigarette off or a bag of trash or a bag of chips or a candy wrapper, what, whatever. And that is an abhorrent act that in other countries you're fined for. You may even pay a fee, you know, for violation, a thousand dollars or what have you, for littering. But in Muslim countries, this is prevalent. All right. Forget about what the Muslims are doing. Come look at the teachings of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, If you were walking down the street and you saw a harmful object in people's way and you removed it, this is considered a charitable act. If you saw a banana peel and you know someone might trip and hurt themselves and you removed it out of people's way, this is a charitable act and you will earn a good deed. Let alone throwing the banana peel. If Islam is promoting that you remove it, would it promote that you throw it? You throw it, then you remove it, say, I'm going to get a good deed? Are you playing games with yourself? That means that to begin with, Islam does not allow this kind of mistreatment of the environment. It does not allow it. But do Muslims implement that? For the most part, no. Do non-Muslims implement that? For the most part, yes. Is the issue with Islam? No. The issue is with the Muslims. I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you to become, uh, uh, to, you know, to become a Muslim because of Muslims. I'm telling you to become a Muslim because of Islam. And there's a big difference between the two. In fact, many people, if they just look at Muslims, they will never become Muslims. Sadly. But that's not the objective. Don't look at the actions of Muslims who may be good and may be bad. While they are bad examples, they are also good examples, to be fair. Naam. Alright, so questions on the mic from the sister side. In response to the earlier sister's question about refugees, I'd like to hear your advice to young men and women who are angry, emotional, impassionate about the refugee cause and who sometimes go to take up arms with ISIS because they've been brainwashed into thinking that is the correct method. So what would you advise? Because I'm sure a lot of us have felt severely angry, especially what's going on in Lola and Myanmar and all of these issues. Thank you. Very good. I gave a khutbah, ironically, I gave a lecture on this very topic last Friday. Um, um, I, I, the, 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 the people that uploaded the, the khutbah, however, did not put a title for it, so let me fix that. But, but just to give you a brief answer right now, this is an excellent question. Uh, that's why I personally am not a fan of promoting a, a broadcasting news of Muslim sufferings around the world. Many people think that they prove their uh, allegiance and their love of the religion by having uh, like public speakers, by telling you every day and every night what happened here and what happened there. In the process, they show images of people that are being victimized, people that are being killed, and this will affect the viewers, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. And sadly, many people that are not under control, they don't let religion control the, their actions. They let emotions control the actions, wind up taking the matter into their own hands and creating a bigger disaster than the existing one. That's why Islam is very specific about acting upon emotions. At the time of the Prophet, when he first started propagating Islam, the Muslims were being persecuted by the leaders of Quraysh. Quraysh is the city in which the Prophet used to live. The tribe, I'm sorry, of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he would walk by Ammar ibn Yasir. And he would walk by some of the Sahaba who were being tortured before his eyes. Mind you, the Prophet used to observe the torture of fellow Muslims before his eyes. Now, do you think it was easy for an influential person like the Prophet to go to some other country and he had very rich companions? Uthman ibn Affan was a millionaire. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was a millionaire. Uh, uh, Abdul Rahman uh, uh, anhu was a millionaire. All of these Sahaba, Na'uf, these were millionaires. He could have easily recruited them and purchased weaponry and arms and what have you 
and he could have hired soldiers from another country and he could have eradicated and destroyed the whole of Quraysh to defend the Muslim who was being tortured. However, the Prophet used to walk by them and say, Sabran ala yasir fa inna maw'idakum al jannah. Be patient, O people of Yasir. Verily, your place of meeting is paradise. So the Prophet saw Muslims being persecuted and he did not let his emotions be the judge or be the reason for him to take action. Instead, he was establishing the teachings of Islam among his companions. And so similarly, you have to follow the same footsteps of the Prophet. Don't let these videos or the fact that the Muslims in Syria are being persecuted, don't let that cause you to go and take matters into your own hand when you wind up creating a bigger issue than what we're already dealing with and you will not fix the problem. Yeah, Jama'ah, how long has the Syria issue been going on? How long have the Muslims been making supplication to God in every Ramadan, in every Qunut, in every place in the world? Don't you think Allah's victory could have come if Allah wanted to aid us? It could have. But we're not ready. Inna Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusim. Allah will never change the affair of the people until they change what is within themselves. We don't want to change. The change is not going to happen. You going and killing someone is not going to fix the problem. Your job is to calm down and relax and learn Islam and implement it in your life. Period. That is your obligation. You got money, you want to help a needy person, Barakallah feek, may Allah bless your efforts. Go by all means, make sure you go through the right channels though. Don't go give it to some weird organization that turns out to be a terrorist organization. Next thing you know, you're in jail. Many people don't know what they're doing. They give the money to this guy who gives it to this guy who turns out to be affiliated with, I don't know, some ISIS group. And then you're the, you were doing a good deed, now you're in trouble. You also have to know where you're spending your money. So if you want to help, help. But in reality, it's not an obligation on you to do anything. Because it's not about manpower. It's about belief. How many people pray Fajr and Jama'ah? Go to the local masajid of the Muslims. The morning prayer, which is around 5, 6 a.m., depending on where you are in the world. How many people? You have two rows. In reality, in the neighborhood, there, there could be 50 rows. Only two go. This is how much God is, has become. This is the value of God in the lives of Muslims, let alone other people. And then you expect things to be fixed by you picking up a clash and cough and going over there with, as soon as you get picked up by ISIS, you, you automatically you become a slave and Allah Alam, what else they do to you. Now we've heard horrible, horrendous stories. No, 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 no. Doesn't work this way. Another question from the brother's side. Someone else. Someone else. I'll see you. We got a sister. Okay, so a question from the floor. Is there are a lot of questions right here. It says, nowadays women wearing hijab is quite difficult to get jobs, especially in the Western world. Is it okay to work without the hijab? and then outside put our hijab, or we just have not to work in those places. Really? I mean, you know, what's the point of wearing the hijab outside if you're gonna take it off inside? What is the hijab? You see, that question, that question signifies a, a serious misunderstanding of hijab. The Muslim uh, female dress code that entails that she covers uh, certain areas of her body that God has made attractive by default. And the objective of that is, of course, the preservation of that female in, in terms of her own self. And then it's for the preservation of the society in general. And while this ruling seems to seem uh, uh, difficult for people and why and I, you know, I like to express myself and so on and so forth then we can also say okay where do you draw the line because a lot of people like to walk around naked who can tell them no why do you put on clothes why are you wearing clothes if you if expressing your individuality is so important why did you come here with clothes on you could be comfortable with yourself but naked so you could have come here naked but you, for whatever reason, people put on clothes. And so according to the same principle and logic, then, uh, you know, the woman has that understanding as well. And therefore she knows how she could be mistreated because of the evil men. And we're not going to blame the woman and blame the men. Everybody is guilty in some way. The men are to be blamed as well. Bottom line is it's means of protection and preservation. 
for the well-being of everybody. And uh, so, if you understood that purpose behind the hijab, you will know by yourself, you will answer yourself, it wouldn't make sense that you don't wear it in, during the job and then you wear it outside. Because you're allowing yourself to be, uh, you know, to be in violation during some part of the day and then you're implementing it during the rest of the day, which is better than someone who doesn't wear it altogether, but it still doesn't solve the problem. So the truth of the matter is, you don't have to work in these places. And I'm, I'm wondering which countries are that strict. From what I know, from what I've seen, and unless it's really like really minor countries, a woman is able to get a job with the hijab. Women work in, in government positions wearing hijab. Women are able to prove themselves and establish themselves, and the hijab does not prevent them from being able to you know, progress and, and, and be of benefit to the society. So I don't think removing the hijab is an issue. Because why is, a woman, why is one woman allowed to wear a, a mini skirt to work and the other one is not allowed to cover her hair? Who, who decides these things? This is crazy. Do you know who made these decisions? Men! Who does not want to see a covered woman at work because that's not sexy. He wants to see a woman in, you know, skimpy clothes because that's sexy. So obviously in the favor of men, yeah, you don't get hired because you're boring and you get hired because you're hot. And so that's a woman allowing herself again to be mistreated by the male gender. And that's where I was defending women earlier when I said Islam does not look at them equally. Because we identify this, this right of a woman and she cannot be allowed, the, the, the male may not continue to oppress women in this fashion by looking at them as mere sexual objects. So Islam actually offers a solution for this. So either you find a job where you can keep your hijab or you know, you find an alternative, but you may not do this 50-50 stuff. What does Islam say about different sexualities? What is it that is so wrong about wanting to gather their bravery to find love despite the amount of hatred in the world? Is it wrong for my Muslim friend who is supporting me till now? We go back, look, this is, there's a one answer solution for all of these topics. We've, we've learned them, we're familiar with them. And until now, I haven't found any single person who's able to give a satisfactory answer. And the question that I ask, the counter question is, where do you draw the line? Who decides? Who decides? So the people that want to express their sexuality with, uh, with the same gender. Then now, if, if you acknowledge that, that's cool, that's your right, you want to acknowledge that. Acknowledge that some men like sheep. And you can't say nothing about it. And some like dogs. And you can say nothing about it. And some older man likes a young seven-year-old girl. You can say nothing about it. And I can give you hundreds of examples. By, according to the same law, if you are cool with this, then you have to be cool with that. You cannot say a male may not like a female. I mean, a male may like a male, but a male may not like an animal. Why? Why? Is it you? Who, who decides? Who gave you the right to make this okay and this not okay? See, when we speak as Muslims, I don't, it's not like what I think. It's what God revealed. So I, I speak with confidence about what God allowed when He didn't allow. When you speak, you don't have any support. Except your personal opinion. And that personal opinion can be countered by opening the door as wide as you can. If you start allowing this, then you also have to allow this and that and this and that. And then where do you draw the line? At what point do you say, wait a second man, this is too much. This is too much. No one has an answer for that. I'm, we're here today, we'll be at the booth tomorrow, we'll have lectures until the DIW. I look forward to a genuine, a satisfactory, persuading, convincing answer to this. Where do you draw the line? Until a human being is able to offer a true solution, then I stick to my principle that God knows better, I go by the law of God. He made male, he made female, and he said, no males together, no females together, I'm satisfied. It makes sense to me. Physically, logically, religiously, in every respect. To me, it makes sense. You feel differently? Two thumbs up for you. Prove it. And tell me, where do you draw the line? If you don't know, then you got an issue. How do you resolve slash address the issue of extremism tainting the image of Islam? 
by, by spread of knowledge, by awareness, awareness, awareness. So you cannot speak enough about this. I personally am an advocate of this topic. I am very outspoken about it. So if you, are, if you care, uh, if you listen to my lectures which are available on YouTube, you find many, many lectures and, and uh, Friday sermons addressing this very issue of extremism, what is okay and what is not okay, and how to understand it in an Islamic context. So it's a matter of you being aware and then creating awareness among people. That's the only way you can defeat it. Otherwise, it's an epidemic and it's disastrous. Okay, so this question has, it's quite lengthy, however, what it says is, what is the Islamic definition of oppression? And how should the male and female interact according to Islam? And then third question after you yeah, the, the Islamic definition of oppression is very vast and it's specific to the area in which you're discussing it. Meaning, in the area of finance, oppression could be that you do A, B, C, D things. There's not one answer for this. So, oppression is basically transgressing against others' rights. Uh, by definition, it's this transgression and the affliction of harm upon someone else. How? It depends on what topic. In every area or science of Islam, oppression can take different shapes and forms. So that's the general answer. What was the second part? How should the male and female interact according to Islam? Respectfully. Respectfully, we are allowed to have uh, conversations and discussions within a context of, you know, being students or being a, a business, if you want to buy, purchase, talk. All this is within Islamic guidelines. Islam does not prohibit the, you know, conversation between male and female. It simply channels it. It gives it certain guidelines that have to be adhered to by both the male and the female to preserve the, the discussion from diverting into something else. That's it. It's about maintaining discipline and decency among both genders. If there's an interest that is beyond the mere conversation that happens between a male and a female, then there's a constitution for this where you can get married. If there's an interest among two people beyond what is normal, then they get married. And Islam did not offer any other solution. There isn't any girlfriend, boyfriend, let's try each other out for a few years, see how good we get along, see if we have chemistry with each other, then biology with each other, then, you know, physics with each other. You try all the different sciences. And then you find out after five years, oh, I, I, I don't like him. He's a jerk. Wallah. <laughs> now you spent half of your life with him. Now you're going to try looking for the next Joe. And you spend another three years. By the time you get married, for the most part, it's going to be the same thing. At some point, you're going to be at odds with that person. And you don't, just, you don't just unplug like this. So, you know, you have to learn how to deal with it intelligently. That's it. It's not about trying each other out. It's about there's a genuine interest. There are parents involved. You go and you seek the marriage of that young lady and you get married in a halal way and you enjoy your life. And then you can go, you can go full fledged after you're married. The wife does not wear hijab and she puts on all the makeup in the world and all this crazy stuff that you can think of. Everything within Islam is pretty much allowed. What is not shown to the people within the couple, not only is it allowed, it's obligatory on both the male and the female to better themselves for their spouse. Meaning you cannot come smelling like armpit and just expect the wife to be in love with you 24-7. Say, I don't need to shower because, you know, I'm, I'm such a, uh, you know, whatever you call it, such a uh, hulk. No, Habibi, you have to clean yourself, you have to maintain yourself, even your breath. The Prophet, upon entering the house, the first thing he would do, he would brush his teeth because he would not want to conversate with his wife with a bad odor. Now, where, did, where is this today? And the woman similarly has an obligation towards her husband to beautify herself for him so that he doesn't have to look outside. He's satisfied with what, we ha what he has. And so Islam put principles for both genders to maintain the harmony and the love between them for years. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and so on and so forth. It's a beautiful thing if you only adhere. The third question from the very same questionnaire was, how can Islam resolve the issue of purchasing power of money in terms of a loan because $100 in 2008 has different purchasing power compared to $100 in 2018. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's too, too technical and too much money is involved. I'm already cluttered. 
Maybe uh, Sheikh Sabur tomorrow will address this. I don't know. Keep that question in, uh, on hold. No? I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer. And in Islam, there's no shame in me to say I don't know. Actually, that is the best answer is I don't know. Speak to someone who's well-versed in the area of finance. I know there are many, maybe among the students, and maybe they can give a better answer. I don't know. She had a question. Actually, not me. But the questioner says, do you think you're better because you're a Muslim? Better than who? Where you draw the line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey. Good comeback. That's right. I don't think that I am better because I am Muslim, but I believe being a Muslim is better than being a non-Muslim. Yes, 100%, 100% no sugar coating. Believing in God is better than disbelieving in God. Doing righteousness is better than doing evil. Spreading peace on earth is better than spreading violence and corruption. That's a given already. And if Islam is the way for me to do this, then yes, by default. But individually speaking, I cannot say I'm better than anyone. I personally, and any Muslim should say the same, we cannot say I am better than you. Because, because, you are only speaking about the present. Meaning, I'm a Muslim now, and that person may be a non-Muslim, and I say I'm better than you. It could be that in two years time, you leave Islam, he enters into Islam. You have no right to make that self-assessment, self-evaluation, self-righteousness, you know, and claim that you are better than any other human being. We say, generally speaking, practicing is better than not practicing. Believing is better than disbelieving. But individually speaking, this is only determined after you die, before God, on the Day of Judgment. Very good question on the sister's side, if there's any. Yeah, the young lady with the hijab has had a question for a while. The red shirt. Yeah, please. Um, my non-believer friend said, is asking, how can a non-believer who has lost spiritual connection with God find faith in religion slash Islam again? By, by being sincere. I understand, you know, humans, uh, depending on what a person goes through in their life, uh, a, a trauma, could be very much a factor in, in the disconnection between the person and the creator. For example, I know from, my, from relatives of mine who have turned into atheism or turned to atheism because, for example, she loves children and she's, she's, just, she's barren. She, does not, she cannot be pregnant. And that's something that to that relative of mine is extremely painful. And in her mind, how can there be a God who knows how much I love children, deprive me of children. And that could lead a person to disconnect from God and to lose their spirituality and to become, you know, an atheist. I totally understand. But that only happens when a person is looking at things from a very, very limited angle. If you look at things in a very superficial, shallow manner, I can understand why something like this could impact your such uh, your life in such a way and have you make these drastic decisions the solution for that is that you need to learn about who God is and when you learn who God is through his revelation you can no longer it's impossible impossible for you to know who Allah is based on the teachings of the Quran and based on the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and then end up with this ideology of why did God deprive me of children and made me barren even though I love children? Why? Because Islam and knowing God goes strictly against this type of limited understanding of God. Why? Because first and foremost, you have to establish the difference between the creator and the creation. And that what appears to be good to you could actually be harmful and what appears to be harmful to you can actually be good. To give you a relevant example, a practical example, if someone, if your child, if you had a child and he was bit by a snake, and the only way to save his life is by amputating his arm, you would willingly go to the doctor and say, chop off his arm now to save my child. Had the child not been bit by a snake, would you ever take your child to a doctor and say, chop off his arm? That seems like the most ludicrous thing to do, right? You, it would never make sense. 
what made it okay? The context. Because of the greater benefit, you allowed a harm to take place for the greater benefit that God had in, in plan. So this understanding of yours, you have to copy and paste it across everything that happens in this world. Everything that happens in this world, you're looking at it from your glasses, from your view, but you don't see the bigger picture. And so learn how to broaden your mind and see things differently. You will be able to deal with them in a better way. You will have more acceptance of God. I could want so many, there are so many things that I want, that you want, that you ask God for actively in every prayer and you still don't get them. Because you think they're ultimately good for you and God knows that they're ultimately bad for you. So you don't get them. If you're narrow-minded, you could say, what kind of God is this? I've been making dua for this thing for five years. For five years, you want to, you've been wanting to get married. And until now, you haven't found the right spouse. You may be thinking, despairing from God's mercy. Why am I not finding a spouse? Because according to God, this is not the right time. It is not the right time. Perhaps if you were given that spouse, you will become too preoccupied with it. It will take away from other important things in your life that you don't see now. You don't know. You don't control. It could be that God wants you to be close to your parents who are reaching old age. And by you getting married, it means you're moving from your country to another country. If you move to another country, your parents who need you don't have access to you anymore. And so God doesn't give you that now. You want it. But God wants the ultimate good for you through servitude to your parents. At old age, He deprives you. This is a very small example. But it applies across the board every single day. When you think like this, then you will no longer have that disconnection with God. You would, that's why we learn in Islam the beautiful teaching of istikhara. Salatul istikhara, the prayer of consultation from God. Where you actively ask God, I don't know if this thing is good for me or not. If it's good, bring it forth. If it's bad, keep it away from me and give me something better. You leave the judgment and the decision up to God. And you go with the flow. You will live with a peace of mind. If it doesn't happen, you're happy, content. If it happens, you're happy, content. That's it. Then life is sweet. Wallah, life is sweet. Faith, faith has sweetness. And the people with faith are the most calm, collected chilled individual you will ever meet because they know that the matter is with God and so they don't have any issues um, I'm, I'm so sorry to take up some more time but she said that she already knows her disconnection with God and the reasons behind it what she wants to understand is how can she seek the truth and a better understand God and reestablish this lost connection two, two things very good two things number one and the most important is supplication. If she, she's speaking as someone who believes in a God. If she didn't believe in a God, that wouldn't be an issue. She wouldn't have an issue with disconnection. She would be like... She, she's an I understand. From a Hindu background. I, yes, I understand. Logic, I'm, I'm speaking logically. That person is saying she feels disconnected, right? You only feel disconnected when there's another thing to connect to. If she doesn't believe in anything to connect to, then where's the disconnection? If I don't have a network, if there's no DG in uh, my telecom and Batika, and you say I have no connection, okay, no connection with what? You feel disconnected from, there's no, there's no signal to begin with. There's no operator to begin with. When there's an operator and you're not connected, like what happened to me earlier when I arrived, I had no internet, I felt disconnected. I had to solve the problem. So she might not be aware, but she's insinuating belief in God. Therefore, she's looking for the connection. So now I say, supplicate to this God. Beg Him for guidance and learn about Him. These two things will bring about the ultimate result. If she doesn't believe in a God to begin with, then we have to start from a different foundation, which is the establishment of the existence of God. Okay, so is there any question from the brother's side? Yeah, Sheikh. There's always a troublemaker. Every DIW, some guy comes with the... No, I'm just kidding. Okay, go ahead. Okay. No, no, hold on, hold on. Here's a microphone too. All right, it's working. Um, is it possible to answer two questions? Uh, ask two one, questions? One, 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 one. one. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, 
Listen, inshallah, tomorrow, what time is the booth open? When are you open? <laughs> If you tell me the hours, I'll tell you my availability. It, whoever wants to discuss anything further, I usually come around at the booth, whatever the booth is nowadays, and we can just chillax and talk for as long as you want and discuss whatever you want. Just in case you're not satisfied now. I'll still answer your question, but for the rest of you, male or female, we're open to have further discussions about anything that you feel was not addressed adequately from here because we have time limitations. Now. You like tea? <laughs> tea? Yeah. I love coffee, bro. And notice that there's no coffee here. <clears throat> Anyways, um, so back to the question. I'm just joking. Um, you mentioned that there was um, one of the issues of, of being Muslim is that you would prefer peace over, I think, evil is what you mentioned. Anyways, so um, what, what was your definition of peace exactly? Coexistence. Coexistence peacefully. That's my definition of peace. That Muslims and non-Muslims as they have existed throughout the ages in the same countries, specifically Lebanon, Palestine, before the politics, minus politics, in terms of the relationship between the people of different religions, there was absolutely no issue. Of course, there are other forces, external forces that kind of instigate and caused uh, all types of riots and, and in-war fighting and what have you between people of, of different religions. But technically speaking, it's about coexistence. We are in a time of coexistence and dialogue. It is not the time for warfare, if that's what you in, you're referring to. It is not the time for warfare. It's the time for dialogue and coexistence, sharing, explaining, bringing people to the light of Islam. That's, that's the obligation in this day and time. No, that's enough. That we can discuss tomorrow, inshallah. Okay, so is it okay to lie with an underlying good intention? For example, to surprise someone. Or when your mother cooks something bad, but you say it's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that type of lie is okay. But uh, the first one, I'm not sure about the surprise part. I don't know what, how much lies you're going to have to make to surprise someone. Um, you, could, you could play with words to some degree where you're not technically lying. You don't want to lie flat out. Uh, but for, for one spouse, that applies to the mother or the spouse. If, if she ma made a terrible meal, like you know some fried frogs, and it's not really your choice of preference, then you can just make it seem like it's all gravy. But you know. Don't, don't make it a habit to lie all the time. Yeah. What is your advice to a young sister who has committed zina or fornication? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Repent to Allah and start a new page. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Islam, uh, even though it has rulings about, uh, pretty harsh rulings about those who are involved in this act, this is only if they go and they basically submit themselves or they surrender themselves to the authority and they say, go ahead and implement the, the, the rules on me. If they don't, and that happened many times at the time of the Prophet, shh, close it, seal it. Allah concealed it, keep it concealed, don't tell people about it, don't make it an issue, and don't let it haunt you. Be careful of the shaitan, if it's a Muslim. Be careful of the shaitan using this as means of misguiding you by telling you that you're not good enough. That that's how people go astray. People go astray step by step by them saying, oh, I'm not good, I'm a hypocrite. People think I'm such a righteous person, but I know myself behind closed doors, I'm, I'm filthy. And so this is hypocrisy. Why do I even pray? So I, then they start abandoning aspects of the religion slowly but surely until they leave the whole thing. When we have clear instructions from Allah that no matter how often you sin, seek forgiveness and repent and continue. Even if you spend your whole life committing the same sin, and I'm going to be very straightforward, you're addicted to porn. You can't stop watching pornography. You're a Muslim, you fear Allah, you pray jama'ah in, in Fajr with the Muslims, and then you finish salah and you go watch some crazy stuff. It's in shaitan's interest that you reach a point where you say, you know what, you're a liar, 
You're a hypocrite. You're, a, you're nothing. Don't pray anymore. How dare you stand before God while you are that guilty afterwards? And then you wind up having two problems. You're still watching pornography and you don't even pray anymore. Whereas, had you continued to pray and struggle with yourself, you feel guilty every time, you leave it alone. A week later, you fall victim again. Then you leave it alone and you continue struggling. Every time you repent to it, Allah will erase the past. You know this. Every time you fall into it and you repent to Allah, it will be erased from your book. You will not be asked about it on the day of judgment if you met the conditions of repentance. So you continue to repent even if you spend your entire life in the process. What you don't want to do is let the shaitan take you away from the path because you're sinful. The Prophet said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every son of Adam is sinful and the best of those who sin are those who repent. And if we didn't sin, Allah would have created another creation who would sin, so they will seek forgiveness, so He can forgive them. So the bottom line, it's, it's already part of the process that God is forgiving and you are sinful, and that's how you maintain your relationship between the Creator and the creation. Don't try to change that. You're not going to become an angel. You will continue to sin. Every time you sin, you repent. So sister, you've done this, repent to Allah, and even if you fall into it again, لا قدر الله once again repent to Allah. Don't ever let the shaitan make you feel that you're not worth it or that you're not good enough. You never know. Allah is merciful and Allah has only let one, one percent of His mercy in this world and 99 percent of Allah's mercy He has restored and preserved for the people on the day of judgment. So plenty of mercy is, is awaiting us. It doesn't mean we take advantage of that and we go full-fledged into sinfulness. But we have to understand who God is so that when we transgress, we don't destroy ourselves in the process. Now, Why were wars waged? Could the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be backed with love slash peace if Allah decreed that? Yes, it could have been, but Allah didn't decree that. There you go. <laughs> okay. Islam does not promote oppression. Then how does Islam accommodate the LGBT community without oppression? <laughs> I don't know. How does it accommodate them? Why? Are they being oppressed? Y'all go over there and like, you know, tear down their stuff or flyers or do, does anyone do any vandalizing? What, what, again, what is the definition of oppression? Oppression, if you mean that I disagree with you, I'm oppressing you, then you're oppressing me because you disagree with me. Haha. -ha. I mean, come on guys. You disagree with me, right? You have an issue. You have an issue. You're oppressing me. I disagree with you, I'm oppressing you. No way. Disagreeing is not oppression. Oppression is afflicting harm upon you. Not voicing my opinion. Everybody can voice their opinion in this regard. So I don't understand what the community is referring to as being oppressed by the Muslims. But then again, whatever that may be, because I'm not part of the society here, I'm not part of the campus, so I don't know what's going on behind, you know, when I'm gone. I will say, generally speaking, we are proud of our stances. We're not ashamed of what we believe in and we promote it uh, actively among the people and we want to promote this kind of healthy you know, lifestyle among everybody. That things remain as God uh, intended them to be. In the process, some people may feel oppressed. That's unfortunate, but it's not intentional. It's not intentional. Okay, so the questioner says, it's not a question, just need to prove for atheists that there is a God in your own way. I, I mentioned that many times in the lecture. I, I said, I look at myself, I personally just look in the mirror. And then I watch Animal Planet. And the combination is just done. <laughs> and I know you're like, yeah, I like that connection. No, seriously, I just observe human beings and then I observe the creation of God and I'm sold. I'm trying to remember what that animal was. What is that, that bird that has these feathers? Like these long feathers with like glitter and diamonds in them? Peacock. Peacock, yeah. Bro, I mean, wallah, man. Just, I saw, I saw one and I was like, how, what, what, I mean, seriously? Like seriously, this is, the, how did this come about? Who, who made this? Did you, did you human beings create it? They'll tell you, no, I got nothing to do with this. I got nothing to do with this. Who made this so perfect? So beautiful? So mesmerizing? I'm sold. I see this, I believe in God. I don't know, it doesn't take more than that for me.
I hope you feel the same way. Prophet peace be upon him visited the skies and had interaction with Musa Ibrahim We believe they have passed away as mortals. So what was their status as beings back then and now? What? Yeah. <laughs> Next question, man. I'm, I didn't understand. I'm For sorry. the questioner, I believe you might want to talk to uh, so Musa later on during the book tomorrow. Inshallah, yeah. That's the case. So I'm going to open the floor again to questions, and we'll start off with the sister's side. So because we're talking about are we better off without religion, and religion, talking about Islam, is often seen um, as mere rituals or just acts of worship in the masjid or elsewhere. So how do we uh, instill the teachings in our life or make it look like it's something normal, which we do on a daily basis? Um, how do you do that? That's, that's a challenge. Uh, that's up to each individual. How, how far, to what extent do they want to go in implementing Islam in their life? Look, we are, we're creatures of habit. And, and when you get accustomed to doing something often and repeatedly, it becomes second nature. And so people that adhere to Islam on a regular basis have absolutely no issue with the guidelines of Islam because they become part of their nature. And people that are less practicing struggle as they try to, you know, learn and implement as they go along. So it's really a matter of individual choice. It's an individual choice. How much do you want to implement? Do you want to fall under the ayah where Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu tkhulu fi silmi kaffa? Oh, you have believed, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Allah told us to enter wholeheartedly, meaning full-fledged, 100%. Do you want to belong to those? Do you want to be among those? You could. And you could go halfway. You could go 75, 25, 50, 50. You could be a seasonal Muslim in Ramadan. You're, you're perfect, you're nice, you're, you're good. After Ramadan, you're some regular person, ordinary person, maybe a bad person. That's all an individual choice that each one of us has. What we do know is that we have the will and that we have God's support. Those who strive in God's way to be, become better, they receive divine support. They receive divine support. The person has to take up that challenge. Just like someone who wants to lose weight, they can't just lose weight without going through a process that has to do with exercising and cardio and eating healthy. And it's a very long, lengthy process. Subscribe to a gym or whatever, have to run in the morning. So many things you have to do to achieve something. Now people want to become full practicing Muslims but do nothing about it, it's not gonna happen. You gotta do stuff, you have to sacrifice. Is there any follow-up? There is no. Brother Sai, any questions from you on the mic? He is so tempted to raise his hand. <laughs> there is no. Okay, the question says tips on lowering one's gaze. Ouch, man. Wallah, ouch. That's probably the most difficult thing. But, anyways, I have a lecture on the topic uh, titled. Uh, who knows the, the title of the lecture? The Poisoned Arrow. The Poisoned Arrow. So I suggest that you watch the lecture, The Poisoned Arrow, which gives you some tips and tricks, if we can call it, on how to lower the gaze and maintain your peace of mind and sanity in this society. Huh? Come on. It's okay, bro. No problem. Okay, so the question says, is congregational du'a accepted? And can women leave this in the presence of men if the men are illiterate or do not know the right way of reading? Um, okay, congregational du'a is accepted, but it has to be done in a manner that is in agreement with the sunnah. The evidence for that is that in the Quran, we have uh, the reference in the Quran where Musa, Musa himself, Moses was making dua. And when Allah responded, Allah said, Qad da'watukuma. Allah said, both of your supplications have been accepted in reference to Aaron and Moses, his brother. So it shows that Moses was making the supplication, but Allah approved both because the scholars say uh, Aaron was with his brother saying Ameen to his dua. 
Besides the fact that the Prophet, in when leading Jumu'ah, he would make dua and the Muslims will uh, make a congregational supplication with him. What we don't want to do is turn this into an act of worship that is above and beyond what the Sunnah is stipulated, where people do it after every prayer and so on and so forth, different occasions. As for the female leading that among other males, I honestly don't know. That's something that requires to be researched because we know that the voice of the woman is not something that has to be concealed. It's not like her body that she is expected to cover. So she doesn't have to cover it. So that's one way of looking at it. Therefore, she technically may speak in the presence of men. And therefore, whether she's making dua, which is even more virtuous than, than uh, something else, is allowed. Then you have the idea of, but in the salah, if a man was to make a mistake, women are to clap and not to say, correct them. You know, it, it becomes a little more technical and I don't have a fatwa that I'm aware of. So I have to research this matter, inshallah. Maybe we can find an existing fatwa and share it with you tomorrow in the booth. All right, any questions from the sister side? Some would argue that a woman's voice is awra and that she shouldn't laugh too loud, she shouldn't sing, she shouldn't um, voice, and then that also translates into she shouldn't voice her opinion, she shouldn't be opinionated and loud about her ideas. What is your response to these somewhat backwards that's not correct. A woman's voice is not a aura, and I. What is the evidence? Whoever whoever makes such a claim, then uh, as as the you know we learn, al uh, bayina The evidence is incumbent on the one who makes a claim. So if someone were to claim that the voice of a woman is something that cannot be displayed or cannot be made loud, period, then we require an evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. And once they provide an evidence, because someone may give you an evidence, you have to look at this evidence in the context of other evidences. So when you have all these evidences where companions would come to the wife of the Prophet and ask her questions, and Aisha would answer the questions, then how in the world do you understand? How in the world can a woman's voice not be made loud if the wife of the Prophet herself was answering his companions in his absence? So you will have an issue, whoever makes that claim, I believe it's an extreme stance. I'm not aware of a valid scholarly opinion about this. What the scholars do say is the tone in which the woman is speaking is, could be problematic. Not her speaking, but the manner in which she speaks. And I think you understand what I'm referring to. Meaning, there's a flirtatious type of way of speaking and there's a formal way of speaking. And that is something that any man or woman can decide to activate at any point. And so Islam has an issue with that flirtatious manner in speaking and not the voice itself. And you cannot say that a woman may, may now has to be subdued or she may not voice her opinion or she may not have a stance on something because of her voice. That's nonsense. And I personally genuinely don't know of any Islamic evidence that supports that. And that is not fair. Actually, that is not fair because the whole... Uh, history of the prophets, uh, the companions of the prophets, uh, male and female, prove that that this is not the case. Yeah. Any questions from the brother's side? Okay. The question says: Some people wipe their face after dua or supplication. Is this a bid'ah or innovation? It's an innovation. There's no authentic tradition. There are some weak narrations. Weak narrations which don't constitute as a valid uh, Islamic stance. There are no authentic traditions from the Prophet about wiping the face after supplication. We have what is valid or what is allowed from that is the recitation of Qul huwa Allahu Ahad and Qul A'udhu Rabbil Falaq and Qul A'udhu Rabbil Nas before you sleep or you wipe your face and your head and the rest of your body before you go to bed three times. That is established in the Sunnah. But the act of finishing dua, then going this, or people open their, you know, clothes will blow inside. And you know, I don't know what else they did. People go, all this rubbing the eyes. All this came from my grandfather. It's one of my grandfathers from somewhere in the Muslim who invented this while he was very tired or sleepy, or I don't know what was going on with him. There's absolutely no evidences for these. And those acts are prevalent in the Muslim world. Depending on which country you go, this is exactly what happens to every measure. And if you speak against it, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, what are you, why are you changing the religion? You can't even speak against them. But we, we're, we're cool enough to discuss this. And no, these are not stipulated. If someone has an evidence, go ahead. 
But we don't know of any authentic evidence. Any other questions from the floor? The young lady again, is she allowed? Any other questions from the floor but the young lady? <laughs> okay, please. Um, what is your take on women being in positions of power that aren't directly related to states and government? Say, being um, a manager or a CEO? No problem, senora. Or senorita, which one is it? Whatever, no problem. What, we, what Islam has an issue with is the, that high position of rulership on a state level. Yes, Islam does not endorse the idea that a woman runs a country. You will be like, oh. we're like, I know. Simply because men are, and women are not the same. Um, because you can imagine during a world war, if a woman's nail broke during one of these very important sessions and then that just ruined her day and she became completely emotional, what kind of decisions would she make based on that? So women are more emotional than men. We understand that. Women, I know that. Actually, anytime two people get in a fight, like let's say boyfriend, girlfriend, she will tell him, you know that I'm a woman. You know I'm more emotional than you are. You're more rational, I'm more emotional. They, I, they know that when they need to know it, but when it's in another context, they suddenly forget. And so the reality is you know that such, uh, you know, a woman could be on her, sorry, menstruation, uh, she could be unavailable, she could be pregnant, and then she has to deliver a child. Who's gonna run the country while she's busy? So male, the male by default has been exempted from a lot of these things, it doesn't mean that the male is going to be successful. Because you can have a, some funny guy who's in, in, in charge, and he will have a bad day if he spilled the coffee, and then it will be the same result on his clothes. If he spilled the coffee on his clothes. So we're not saying that men is, is infallible uh, or not vulnerable in the state. Both could be subject to a mistake. But women, by default, are more emotional. Their decisions are more emotional than rational for the most part and so Islam let gave that position to the male who by default is more rational open to errors open to mistake prone to prone to you know misjudgment but not at the same level as the as the female but if it's not running the state if it's CEO running a company whatever go ahead by all means Khadija the wife of the Prophet peace be upon him had her own business and she hired the Prophet he got married to her after he was an employee of hers. So there's no issue in a woman running a business. But the state is a big deal. Because it involves people and, and uh, souls and you know, casualties and all types of stuff. And then that is for, this is where Islam doesn't look at male and female equally. No, this is for the male. <laughs> All the feminist group. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm talking about those who are clapping. It's, I understand. Look, look, what I'm saying is, it's all right, it's all right. Listen, I understand. Look, please understand that if, if you look at, I, I will admit to you that in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, women are, the way they are treated is beyond what Islam allowed in terms of the rights of male and female. Meaning males have abused, abused the rights that Allah gave them in an ugly manner, in an ugly manner. This will not lead me now to compromise my religion and the teachings and now try to fix it by making them equal. I can't do that. I don't have the authority to do that. No, I understand that equality is not a thing. And I truly believe that sexes can never be equal. You are not created. Cool. So I agree with you then that yes, this has led, this kind of mentality has led the people to act a certain way, but it's because they're not looking at the full picture. But when people in your position, and you're quite influential, and I truly enjoyed this talk, but when people like you and even in higher positions, when they say things like, oh, this so-and-so broke her nail so she couldn't function normally, that's reducing us to being incapable of bringing ourselves further from our beauty and reducing us to these mind 
timeless beings that their worth is only their beauty, which is the opposite of the hijab. I agree. Yes, you're right. Maybe the example was a little bit um, extreme. It's intended in a, in a light manner. Uh, but in reality, while some women will not be affected to this degree, from my experience in my life, um, from the interactions with women, you know, I'm talking about family members, my wife, and so on and so forth, sometimes things like that can go way overboard. I understand, but the and so. I No, but see, that's extreme because the whole t it's look. Not I, okay, let, listen, listen. I understand, but when you when you want to, I I agree. I know what you found something to pick on. It's a valid criticism, but to be fair to me, you have to look at my overall speech. I've spent an adequate amount of time explaining to you that we are males are abusing the rights of females and this this and that, and I I did the part of endorsing what the women's rights are within Islam. So given an example which is realistic in some areas, does not take away or make it seem like now that the women have been uh, you know, reduced to creatures who are absolutely incapable of thinking. That's extreme. I just finished praising women for the longest time. I'm not saying you are as um, personally yes. to their beauty. And I fully agree with almost everything you've said in this talk. Yes. And I'm but honored. What I mean to say is, when, especially to the young men in this room and to any brothers, fathers, when people in positions of power normalize such statements and make it pull it off as a joke, and I'm sure everyone's thinking, oh, she's overreacting. Why is she taking this and picking on it? And this third wave feminism is truly taking over control over these girls. Yeah. But when you normalize such statements, it is very harmful to what is basically 50% of the female, 50% of the whole population. It's like saying, oh, men can only be reduced to, you, to their egos, and should you scratch a man's ego, his entire being will collapse. True. True. My, that's what I'm saying. I, see, th th I don't disagree. Yes, that's for the most part, that's how males are. And so that's why I'm, I'm telling you the whole, I know where you're coming from, I, I totally understand. I, I'm acknowledging the, the reality of the psychology of men and women. Uh, and I'm identifying each as being different, and I'm highlighting the areas of weaknesses in both. So what you said would apply to maybe 90% of the men in this room, let alone men outside of the room, no doubt. So the fact that this is how men are, how do I fix it? By not making any mention of it? No. It's an example that you gave, and maybe some might find it offensive, but in reality, it is true. I understand, but I'm not saying that them doing this is the. Uh, sorry. The, yeah. What I mean to say is. <laughs> so you just don't us like. Women, yes. We do not, and people in power, we don't poke fun at men and their behaviors and habits the same way as <laughs> women. Oh, come on. No, honestly, why, why are Maybe you are hanging out with some nice people. <laughs> You're hanging out with some really nice people. I mean, look, I'm, I have family groups of, of, you know, male and female. Man, the type of jokes that they send against males are ridiculous. And they send some against women. And everything is taken in a light manner. I mean, the women in my family, in spite of being liberal, and, you know, you know they're not really practicing for the most part, they still recognize and they make fun of the same joke I made because they know deep down there's some truthfulness to it. Yes, it might be an exaggeration in some context with some lady who may be above and beyond that, but it remains to be something that is not even, if a woman were to react this way, people, even males, will understand. For example, a woman may cook a nice meal and a husband does not show interest or he disdains that meal, or he treats it like, you know, uh, like nonchalant manner, it, no male should be surprised that his wife is offended, and that she might go to the room and cry. Let's just be honest. You may say, no, women are, are strong, and she's going to be like, oh, forget you. 
if a woman were to go and cry in the room, believe me, for a man, for a man is like, seriously? Like, what the heck, man? I just don't like the food. What's your problem? But as a male, I, I have compassion. I sympathize with my wife. For me being so a, a bloodless, a cold, I mean, a heartless human being who just didn't appreciate her meal that she spent, you know, half an hour searching online, half an hour to buy the ingredients, two hours to cook it, and then it was all gone to waste. If she cries in her room, I understand. Will a male ever do this? Uh, you don't like it? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I will make this every day. Inshallah, amrik ma kalti. That's the, that's the, so that means, that's just, it's just, as a male, that's how my brain works. But I understand the female, and I'm not going to be upset with her that she, be, I, I would be upset with myself for not showing enough sympathy, uh, empathy for someone whose feelings I hurt. So, no, I understand what you're saying. And Alhamdulillah. I just wanted, why, the reason why I was not to nitpick, but just to bring light to the normalization of the statements and not whether they're true. Or how true they are. I, I accept. Advice taken. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have, we're quite short in time, so I'd like to add, end with this question. But before ending with this question, since you guys left me hanging last yesterday, when I'm giving my announcements, I'm going to get them now. What is the topic tomorrow? Who oh, agrees? We didn't hear. What was it? What is the topic tomorrow? Almost The booth. <laughs> Topic tomorrow is truly the God, myth, or reality. Mm. So the question here is, what happens if you attend all the lectures? Free trip two? Tioman or Tioman? Yeah, okay, that one. Tioman Island. And it's open to two non-Muslims. Nine Muslims? Non Muslims. Non Muslims. I'm like, how's that two nine Muslims? How does that work? That's 18. Okay, so, after Abu Musab finished off with his final remarks, uh, we're going to be having Esha prayer 20 minutes exactly after he finishes off. So, please, let's meet all at the masjid. The last question, which I think acts as a very good closing remark as well, which happens to be. What advice do you have for current Muslims and why? Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a lecture. Um, that's a lecture in of its own. That my advice is to myself really and to everybody else that we have a lot of work to do. And honestly, when you hear and these kind of uh, meetings, these kind of lectures, these kind of get togethers, they really show us what people how people perceive us. Like sometimes we're oblivious to, to the stance that the people have, to the thoughts that they have. We're kind of careless about what people think. But I think events of this nature bring to our attention that there's a lot of work, groundwork that needs to be done. A lot of war, a da'wah work that needs to be done. A lot of foundations that need to be established. And we have a lot of obligations towards the, the non-Muslims on campus and everywhere else in the world. That they see a good example of Islam from us in spite of our shortcomings and that we try to bring the you know the teachings of Islam to them in the best way possible it doesn't mean that we, they will accept Islam it doesn't mean that they have to convert to Islam they can choose whatever they want to choose but it's on us to make sure that we deliver the message as successful as possible with the flaws that we have it's a lot of work that we need to do and you guys being the students in this university you bear that obligation because you're the ones here every day, you're the ones interacting with every day. So the speakers you invite, it's easy for us to come and give you some, some talks and then go back home and, and do nothing about it. The one who actually has to follow up and work upon it is yourselves. And so think, always think as a da'wah machine. Always think of yourself as a da'wah on the go. Your whole life is trying to promote Islam to the best of your ability. Doesn't mean, like I said, I'm the first one to admit I have misrepresented Islam in thousands of occasions in my life. I'm a human being, I might be in the airport, I become angry, I may do something that Islam does not allow. And so 
you, you will fall into this, I fall into this, it's normal that you're unable to stick to the standards of Islam all the time. Like the example I gave. I might give an example that I find humorous and maybe offensive to others. There's not much I can do. You know, you're a human being, you're, you're going to make a mistake here and there. But as the Prophet said, Saddidu wa qaribu. Try to come as close to the target as, target as you can. And then throw. But you have to make an, an effort. You have to make an effort. And if you make an effort, Allah will bless and facilitate. Insightful questions, and personally, as we've seen today, we've seen questions narrated and stated in ways, and saw them narrated and stated in completely different ways. Also, Hannah Taala says, "Udru ila sabi Rabbika bil hikmati wal maulat al hasan wa jadil hum bil ati hasan." What does that mean? Call upon the way of your Lord with wisdom and good speech, and argue with them with what, with what is good. We've seen this example for the sisters. Thank you so much for abiding by this, and for the brother as, brother as well. Thank you very much for that. Tomorrow, God, myth or reality, Aisha at the Masjid. Jazakallah khaira, Abu Sahab. Jazakallah khaira. Barakallah 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 khaira. Barakall